There's no greater love than Jesus. There's no greater love than He There's no greater love than Jesus. So deep within. There's no greater love than Jesus. There's no greater love than He There's no greater love than Second John chapter five or Second John one chapter uh, verses five through thirteen. Second John is just one chapter. Uh, Second John obviously written by John. You know he wrote the, wrote the Gospel of John, right? First John, Second John, Third John. Uh, also, what else did John write? Yeah, there's a gospel, then the three Johns, and one more book. Revelation. Revelation. Yeah, the book of Revelation. John wrote the book of Revelation. All right. So. Yeah, he wrote it. John, yes, John did write a lot of books. And John wrote this particular epistle probably when he was uh, around A.D. 90, 95. John was an older man at this point, and um, uh, he probably wrote it while he was in Ephesus at the time. And uh, that's just kind of a guess. Most theologians, they just kind of guess at that. Uh, but um, it's pretty good... Uh, Pretty good guess, pretty good evidence that that's, that's what he was doing at this time. It was before he was exiled um, to the island of Patmos. Uh, so um, just to give you kind of a background to this, we're going to read the whole thing. We're going to read the whole book right now, and, uh, and it's only uh, 15 or 13 verses. So uh, let, let's, uh, let's take a look at verse 1. If you have uh, your Bibles and you found the other scripture, 2 John chapter 1. Everybody ready? Everybody got it? Yep. All right. Here we go. Here's what it says. It says, The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. Okay. So just pause there for a moment. The elder to the elect lady is talking about himself, writing to um, the elect lady and her children. Some folks believe that that was, that was, a, real, that was a real person that he was writing to, uh, but you know, most theologians, the general consensus among theologians is that uh, the elect represents um, the church and, uh, and her children. 
uh, represent the Christians within that church, okay? So he's talking about the lady and her children there, so to the church and her children. And, uh, and by the way, just so you know, to the elect lady and her children, probably a house church uh, or multiple house churches that were meeting at that time, okay? So anyway, to the elder, to the, uh, the elder, to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us. Now, if you notice, the word truth is used three times right there, just right off the bat, okay? Because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace be with us from God uh, the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. So there's, again, the word truth again, but now he adds the word what? Love. love. And he combines the two, truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out in the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what you have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in this wicked works, uh, in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. The children of your elect sister greet you. All right. In other words, speaking of the church he was at when he was writing to this particular church. All right. So let's take a look at what Hegel says here. He says the theme of this epistle is walking in love, which is a vital component of steadfast living. The world has a perverted view of what it means to love. Would you agree with that? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, it does. And and even in its even in its most positive sense of love, it has a twisted, perverted view. Uh, love based on good works. Love based upon you know uh, accomplishments. Uh, you know, I love you if, or I love you because, or I you know, it's it's just kind of twisted love. But he says in today's culture, often there is little, if any, distinction between love and lust. So, to be sure there is no confusion, John explains in this passage there are three actions required to love as the Bible teaches us to love. First is to practice the truth. Again, this is verses 5 and 6. Now, John writes, and now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning. Now, John's not writing a new commandment. That's, he's not going to do that. He has not received a new revelation as some false teachers are claiming. Now, that could mean that some false teachers were claiming that he, he was trying to receive a, give a new revelation. But I think more importantly what that means is that, that the false teachers were giving these new revelations. And uh, they were trying to bring in these new thoughts and ideas into the church and trying to interject that into the church. Instead, it says he's reminding them to be steadfast in obeying the commandments they have had from the beginning. Now, what is the commandment? Well, John tells us that we are to love one another. Verse 5, biblical love is the clearest test of whether we are truly followers of Jesus Christ. What kind of love? Biblical. Biblical love. Now, we, we would say godly love, right? We'd say godly love is the test. Or, you know, if we were being more, you know, a little bit more um, uh, linguistic, we would say agape love, right? I mean, agape love is godly love. That's the kind of love that comes from God. Is it correct to say biblical love? Yeah, absolutely, because that's where we get it all from, right? Yeah. Is from the Bible, biblical love. And, and that's the point, now I'm just telling you, that's the point John's trying to make here. He wants us to understand that real love is based on biblical truth, right? So biblical love, is it's important to understand that, and, and we'll see why here in just a moment. So he says, he says, biblical love is the clearest test of whether we are truly followers of Jesus Christ. Is the love that we feel, is it biblical in nature? Okay, so how does our Lord make this clear in John 13, 35? Listen to this. And your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. If you have what? Love for one another. 
Okay, so that's what you write. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, the command to love is not unique to the New Testament. In fact, God's command, uh, 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 God's people have had this command from the very beginning. For example, what command does God give through Moses in Leviticus 19.18? Listen to this one. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of the, thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. There you go. So you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That's what God said in the Old Testament there, and all the way back in Leviticus, right? Yeah. So he said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. However, because, Hegel says, of Jesus Christ, we have a new perspective on this old commandment given to us from the beginning. So that's the old commandment given to us, but now we have a new perspective. In other words, it didn't end. It's just now it's deepened. It's, it, it, it's expanded. It's grown in our understanding of it. Jesus says he's giving us a new commandment that we are to love one another as he has loved us. That's John 13, 34. Now, the word translated new is kainos, and it means new in character or quality, not new in time. So the quality is developed. It's deepened. We are not only, he said, Jesus' sacrifice sheds a totally new light on the old commandment. We are not only to love our neighbors as ourselves, but we are to love one another sacrificially as he loves us. So how do we understand what, what kind of depth real love has? How do we know, how do we understand that? We understand it by virtue of what? The Bible, right? By God's word, what, what Jesus did, and as it's recorded, now we understand. And so that's what, as John's writing this letter, he's saying, I want you to understand this. It's, it's what Jesus did that now helps us understand what true love is, what real love is. It's based on his sacrifice, and now for one another, we have to have and express that kind of biblical love. Truth, uh, it, it, it's born out of truth right there. So, in case anyone doesn't understand what it means to love as the Lord commands, John writes this, and this is love that we walk according to his commandments. Okay? The true test of loving, as Jesus commanded, he says, is that, um, is that we walk or live according to his commandments. That's a true test. Are we walking and living according to his commandments? Now, what that means is, are you, are you living according to the word of God, to what he says to do? What what, what we're reading, you know, when we read the Gospels, when we read the New Testament, when we read the writings of Paul, and all, when we read these things, are we seeking to live them out? If we are, then I can tell you, one of the things you're going to want to live out is loving other people, particularly one another, right? The saints. We particularly want to love the saints. But we, we know how to love one another based upon what Jesus taught us in the Bible, right? So it's based on truth. We cannot separate, Hegel says, love for the Lord and obedience to his commands. You can't. You can't separate the two. If you love God, you're going to obey him, right? That's what he's saying. If you love the Lord, you'll obey him. And if you obey him, you're going to love other people because that's one of his commandments. Amen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what he commands us to do, to love others. So, uh, in fact, uh, John 14, 15, listen to this. You know what it says. Just... If you love me, keep my commandments. There it is. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's what Jesus said. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Because of the importance of this truth, John repeats himself and writes, this is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. You need to walk in that. So to, to prove the Bible, uh, to, to rather to love as the Bible teaches, we've got to practice truth. Now, hopefully, what we're going to learn from this passage is that love and truth are dependent on each other. Love and truth are dependent on each other. You can't really love without God's truth, truth. And if you have God's truth, you're certainly going to then exercise love, right? Got God's truth, you're going to exercise love. But you can't love without God's truth. You can't love like God wants us to love without his truth. That's why John mentions love five times in this passage, and he also mentions truth five times as well. So they're they're back to back. They're connected right here. So... To love as the Bible teaches, practice truth. Number two, secondly, protect the truth. This is verses 7 through 11. After reminding his readers of the commandment to walk in love, John moves on to the second purpose for his brief letter. In this warning, uh, it, it, uh, it is this warning, he says, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Now, Jesus warned his disciples that false teachers would arise and deceive many. 
Matthew 24, 11. Now, one group even denied, for example, that Jesus came to earth in the flesh. They taught that he only appeared to have a human body, and, and he, he only appeared that way, and that, that his humanity was really just an illusion. He only appeared, he was like a ghost almost, and, and, uh, and, and yet this strikes at the very heart of the truth of the gospel. In fact, what is the truth according to Colossians 2, 9? Listen to this. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Okay. So for in, for in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. That's important. See, that's why it's important to understand biblical doctrine. Because it helps us to separate false truth and, and, and false teaching. Um, it helps us to identify that. I mean, it wouldn't seem odd, would it, for somebody to say... Hey, you know, Jesus, really, the truth is, Jesus was really just, he was more of an illusion than he was a real person. I mean, everybody saw him as a person, but it was just, it was just kind of a, he, he was just being manipulated by God in that sense and stuff. So it was just kind of an illusion. And so he, he, he's, he's a real big and good example for us to follow. Is that, is that good? It's not true. No, it's not true at all, which makes it what? A lie. A lie, which makes it what? False, false teaching. teaching. It's a false message. It's false teaching. And the problem with that is if you believe that, then you've denied the gospel. Because the, the gospel doctrinally teaches what? That Jesus was what? Completely fully man. human. He was a fully a man. Fully that God human. dwelt in humanity. He dwelt in a human body. God dwelt in that human body. So we, we, we have to hang on to these things so that we can, we can tell the difference between the two like that. And it comes at us so subtly that sometimes if we aren't thinking about biblical truth, that we just accept some stuff and, and we shouldn't do that. Well, anyway, Hegel goes on to say, to deny Jesus was God incarnate is to deny his suffering and death on the cross for our sins. And it does. Because if he wasn't really in body form, then what's the point of him going to the cross, right? What's the point? His sacrifice was meaningless. So denying this truth identifies us with the deceiver then and the antichrist. So if we deny that truth, if we join in with what somebody's teaching in a false way, we're, we're siding with the antichrist. Yeah. We're siding with these things. And so he, he, says, uh, he says these deceivers are agents and or forerunners of the one and final antichrist who's going to deceive the whole world with the exception of the elect. John has already written this is part of the anti, this, this is the spirit of the antichrist which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already, 1 John 4, 3. The spirit of the Antichrist refers to the hostile attitude that's already in the world toward Christ and his followers. And this hostile attitude is ever increasing. It's always growing. Amen? Yeah. Toward believers. It's always growing. So John continues, watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Now this doesn't refer to losing salvation, but to losing the rewards for steadfast living. Um... So, you can lose reward in heaven. You're not going to lose heaven, right? But you can lose some reward. Um, there will be degrees of rewards in heaven, Hegel says, just as there are degrees of punishment in hell. And there are. Uh, as a Christian, why must you appear before the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5.10? Listen to this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. All right, to receive, and that's what he says. Paul says to receive, this is why we got to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, to receive what is due for what I have done in my body, whether it's good or bad. Good or bad. So, which one of those two gets rewarded? The good. <laughs> Obviously the good, right? Jesus isn't going to reward us for what? Bad. The bad, right? Okay. So, Hegel goes on to say, the word translated judgment seat here is the word bima, though, and it denotes what bima describes as a raised platform that is reached by steps. You go up the steps. It is a judgment to determine rewards, not eternal destination. We must all, all Christians, appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive what is due us. However, only unsaved people will appear at the great white throne judgment, according to Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. And if you read that particular passage, I'll just tell you, we won't go there, but if you read that particular passage carefully, you'll find that, uh, that it does talk about that there, the connections that are made implies that there are levels of, 
of punishment in hell, just like there are levels of reward in heaven. And uh, so th there are some people who are going to be punished even more harshly than others. Now, as far as I'm concerned, hell is hell. I mean, I'm looking at hell and going, I don't want even level one, right? I mean, nobody, I mean, you'd have to be insane to say, send me to hell. You know, I want to go to hell. Uh, no, I want heaven. Level one of heaven is great. That's wonderful, right? Yeah. But if we continue to follow Christ and stay steadfast in our love for him and, and, and service to him, then there are multiple levels of reward that we're going to receive in heaven. We're going to be able to do that. And, uh, and so I, I think that's, that, that's exciting to know. In other words, it, it, do you think that's motivating? I, yeah. It is for me. I mean, I, yeah, it's motivation for me. So, so anyway, he says, however, only unsaved people are going to appear at the white throne of judgment. Now, everyone, he says, who goes on ahead, this is verse 9, and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Now, the verb translated goes on ahead or transgress, this is the word proego, and it means to go out of the bounds or to cross a forbidden line. It refers to crossing the bounds of biblical truth. That's what that word means. Also, this word is present tense, which means continuous action. So it's not a one-time crossing of a forbidden biblical line. In other words, uh, he, he's not trying to say or teach you that if you sin one time, then you're out of bounds, you're going to hell. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that if you continue in that, that's the continuous action. If you stay in there without any sense of remorse or regret or anything, then it's just indication of the fact that you don't know how to love, which means you don't know Christ. Right? So, and, and so you're functioning out of just worldly uh, understanding of love, not biblical understanding of love. So he says, anyone who intentionally and habitually crosses the line of biblical truth does not have God. John has already written, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. In other words, there was no repentance, there was no confession, right? So uh, they sinned and didn't mind sinning, and they just kept on doing it. There was no, and they, in fact, they just finally walked away, right? So we're talking about apostasy, right? Uh, apostate right. Christians, those who claim to be Christians but aren't really Christians, all right? So then he says, then what does he write in the remainder of that verse? Listen to 1 John 2, 19. Here we go. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. All right. But they went out. That's what you write in there. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But they went out that it might become plain that they, are, that they all are not of us. Of us became plain like we said I think and I, I know you, you you probably have seen this too and I, we've talked about this but uh, I think 9-11 not 9-11 well I think 9-11 did uh, do some of that but I think the pandemic produced the greatest separation in in the church from those who were genuine Christians to those who were just playing the game I think uh, I think the pandemic helped to separate the two like that so uh, there's a bunch of folks who were going to church prior to the pandemic who decided it's not worth going back right and so they don't go back anymore they just stay home for whatever reason even today and uh, and so they went out from us because they were what not of, not us. of us see so all right so in contrast John writes whoever abides in the teaching in in the teaching has both the father and the son now, this is because having Jesus, Hegel says, is having the Father, and having the Father is having Jesus. Now, this speaks of the deity of Christ, or really the oneness of the Trinity, right? So, it, you know, it's, it's important to understand that. John continues, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, now this is verse 10 uh, in 2 John, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. You guys know what, th th this particular verse right here has been used uh, many generations before to say what? Any, anybody know? I mean, what has this? What has this? What has this verse right here been been used to give us an understanding of what we are to do when false teachers come to our door? Say no, thank you. Yeah, we don't give them an audience, right? We we don't let them into our what? Into our house. Into our house. Look at if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. Or give him any what? Greeting. Um, they're there at your door with an agenda and with a purpose. Now, I know a lot of Christians, and I know I know we, we like to think that if they come to our door, I'm ready to debate them, I'm ready to deal with them, I'm ready to, you know, right? Um, 
but the reality is, is they're ready for you to do that. And they've been readied by their false teachers that they have mm -hmm. to prepare them for that so that when that happens, they're able to reject and ignore you. Yeah. Um, it, but they have an agenda. They have a purpose. Now, who are we talking about when we say that? Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses, right? Mm -hmm. uh, anybody been had a Jehovah Witness knock at your door anytime? Mm -hmm. This year, last year? I mean, yeah. yeah they're, they're, you, you see them out ever so often. Ever so often, I'll see them down our street over there, too. They'll be, you know, going door to door and everything. I, you know, and stuff like that. I like, I like the fact that we have a gate that closes because that's pretty cool. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, they, if the gate's open, they'll drive in and they'll, they'll come up to your door and, not, you know, okay. Is it just Jehovah Witnesses? Mormons. No. What Mormons? Mormons, well. Mormons do it too. Mormons do it a lot. Okay. Anybody else? What if it's somebody you know? Who wants to come and talk to you about what they've experienced in, let's say, uh, as a result of transcendental meditation? Can I come talk to you about what I've experienced? I'd love to sit down with you in your home and share with you what this really happened to me and how this, how wonderful this is and how marvelous this is and stuff. Mm -hmm. See, that, that's where it, it begins to become a little bit dicey and a little bit icy, right? Because now all of a sudden we're going to have to say, you know, nah, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I, I have a different belief system and, and I just don't think I'm ready to have you do that. If you want to come over and have a cup of coffee and do a little Bible study with me, that's fine. You know, I'll, or I'll, I'll meet you someplace and we'll have some Bible study or something like that. You know, that's one thing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, now let me, let me show you why, okay, why it's important. All right, and, and this is what John is saying because of what was going on, okay. Um, John was saying, look, look, he says, this means we are not to practice hospitality toward those who peddle false doctrine. Mm -hmm. Now that's what Hegel says. I agree with it. I, I think that's correct. Uh, look at it again. It says, this means we are not to practice hospitality toward those who peddle false doctrine. We are to give them no encouragement in their deceptive ministry. In other words, we're encouraging them when we, when we do that. We're encouraging them. Okay? So this may seem harsh and unloving, Hegel says, but love for the truth forbids condoning false teachings in any form or fashion. Love for what? The truth. The truth. Knowing the truth and loving the truth. Okay, it, it forbids that. Um, therefore, John warns, for whoever greets him takes part in his, in his wicked works. Verse 11. So if you greet him and come in, let him come in and tell him all that, you're, you're, you're condoning it. You're taking part in it in that sense. So false teachers, he says... And their followers seem nice and kind on the outside. And they do because they are severely and completely deceived. Mm -hmm. Okay? It doesn't change their nature. They're, they're trying to be that way for a purpose, for an agenda. He says, but inwardly or spiritually, they are quite different. All right? So that's, they're not that good on the inside. Look, you've got to remember they are what? Sinners without Christ. Right? Mm -hmm. Look, I'm, I'm sorry. Jehovah's Witnesses are without Christ. Yeah. They, have a, they, they don't understand the gospel. Mormons are without Christ. I mean, I wish I could tell you, yeah, there's some saved Mormons. Maybe there are, but I'm going to tell you, I, I, that, that has to be between God and them. But, but from my perspective, they, they don't know Christ. And, and once you know Christ and you know the truth, how can you stay in a situation of false teaching and doctrine like that? How many Christians who have been saved have come out of that for us to turn around and say, oh, it's okay to stay in it? Yeah. No, it's not okay, right? If you truly get saved, if you truly know the truth, you know you cannot have fellowship with that kind of false teaching and false message. Does that make sense? And, and all we have to do is just look at all the people who have escaped that through the power of Christ and, and then to all of a sudden say, well, it's okay? No, it's not okay to stay in that situation. It's not. So, uh, false teachers and their followers seem nice on the outside, but inwardly, spiritually, they're quite different. Therefore, what warning does Jesus give in Matthew 7, 15? Listen to this. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Right. Beware of false prophets, right, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but where inwardly, inwardly they are ravenous, what? Wolves. What's a wolf want to do? Eat 
attack and devour and, right? That's what a wolf wants to do. Inwardly, that's what they are. And, and we've got to remember that. To love as the Bible teaches, practice the truth, protect the truth. Now, the teachings that, that John is conveying has to do with, really now, with the biblical guidelines of hospitality. Not only are Christians, and this was, a tr this was a problem in the early church, because they, they were trying to obey the principles of Paul in Romans 12, 13, where Paul said that we need to be hospitable. We need to open our homes up and be hospitable. And he's, John's saying that that's created a problem in the sense that you're opening it up to, to not to just believers, but to anybody, false teachers who claim to be believers, but they don't believe what you believe, but you're taking them into your home under the guise of we have to do this because of Paul's teaching about, about hospitality. Okay, So not only are Christians to adhere to the fundamentals of the faith, but to the graciousness of hospitality, we need to do that but the hospitality has to be discriminating. Hospita let me say that again. Hospitality has to be discriminating. Um, because false teachers were taking advantage of that then, and they still are today. Uh, false teachers, false, false, they, they would love access to your home and to get into your home. Because once they're in your home, they've, they've planted that seed in your home. And they're going to continue to try to nurture it. Because once you... Once you let them in, they know that they've got an in. It's like the devil. Remember what, remember what we're taught about the devil? Remember what Paul said? He said, don't give the devil a what? Foothold. A foothold. You know what that means? Don't let his don't foot get in the door. Don't let his foot get in the door. When you close the door, kick his foot out of the way and close it. Don't, don't let him get his foot in the door to keep the door from being closed. Don't even allow that. Don't do it. Because once you allow that, it's only the next step till he's inside, right? And once he's in the house... Uh, remember Jesus dealt about that, about delivering demonic spirits from houses and things like that. Anyway, so, uh, y you know, what we have to do is be discriminating about hospitality in terms of that. Now, the basis for hospitality has to be common love or interest in the truth. So, if you want somebody into your home, you got to kind of know that they are believing doctrinally the way you believe. you got to know that they do have a personal, real relationship with Jesus Christ. And they understand the basics, that, that there's only one way to heaven, right? They've got to understand that, that, that they've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. That they believe that Jesus died and rose again. And he died, died and was buried and rose again. That he, he was God in the flesh. They've got to understand that. And I, and I tell you that even the most, even the newest babes in Christ understand those basics. Because that's what ultimately, that's what led them to salvation to begin with, is that understanding. Even as children, there's this understanding that Jesus is God. He is God. And he opened the door with his death on the cross. He, he provided a way for me to be saved. Even children know that. Okay? So we have to know that the, the basis of fellowship has to be truth. Right? And then... Uh, so the, the uh, hospitality has to be common love or interest in the truth and Christians share their love within the confines of that truth then. That's how we express our love within the confines of that truth. That's how we express godly love and it's received by other believers then. Does that make sense? Um, that's what made house churches effective in the first century. Th these teachings right here. They were powerful because they adhered to this. House churches today are adhering to these same principles. We don't want people to come into our homes who are, who are peddling a false teaching. Does that make sense? Because it can infect, and it can affect, and it breaks, and it diminishes the love that's within that body of Christ. In other words, we are not called to universal acceptance of anyone who claims to be a believer. We're not called to do that. Love has to be discerning. So hospitality and kindness have to be focused on those who are attempting to adhere to the fundamentals of the faith. So, sound doctrine must serve as the test of fellowship. Right? Um, I had to kind of know, you know, about, and I, and I kind of want to know about anybody who finds their way into our fellowships. I got to know a little bit about, I got to understand where they're coming from. That's why we talk about the fact that it's important if we can lead them to Christ outside of this meeting, that's where we want to do it. We want to help them to know Christ before they're introduced here as much as possible. 
as I mean, it's always possible. And, and, and certainly, you know, when you find somebody who's just lost and they aren't trying to do anything other than just find the truth, that's one thing, right? That's okay. Right. But if, if somebody comes in and they have this agenda of saying, well, see, I'm a, I'm a Mormon, so I, I'll, I'll come in and see. No, because they claim that they're a Mormon, they already have an agenda. They already have, right? And, and so basically we just have to say, well, I'm sorry, this isn't going to be for you because our doctrines don't match. Our doctrines don't align. If you want to, if you want to reject Mormonism and you want to adhere to Christian truth and Christian doctrines, then that's another thing. That'd be great. That's wonderful. But do you see what I'm saying? We, we can talk to people like that. We just kind of have to think it through and be prepared to do that. And it's okay. And if they, if they decide that they don't want to have anything to do with you because you're that way, well, then that's better, really. That's better for you. Because that just means that they really don't care about you. They have an agenda and you've blocked it. And they can't pursue their agenda. Does that make sense? So, so anyway. All right, sound doctrine, let me say it again, must serve as the test of fellowship. Sound doctrine tests as that. And the basis of separation between those who profess to be Christians and those who, are, who actually are is sound doctrine. And that's what love within the body of Christ is built around. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So that's how we that that's why that's why John is combining love and and tr and truth together. He's putting they're the, they're the same uh, the same coin really, just two sides of the same coin. All right, so we got to pursue the truth. Then here's the next one, verses twelve through thirteen. John writes a brief letter, but he has much more to teach his readers. Therefore, he writes, though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. John's paper and ink were much different from what we have today. His paper was papyrus, which was invented by the Egyptians. Our English word paper is derived from the word papyrus. The papyrus plant was a tall aquatic reed that grew along the Nile River. The center section or pith would be sliced into thin 12-inch strips. Next, the strips would be overlaid vertically and horizontally and mashed together, bonding them together. Often a glue would be used, and the papyrus would then be dried by the sun. The ink then was a mixture of water, charcoal, and gum resin. I do have a piece of papyrus on my wall. It was uh, made for me by Lalo. Uh, Lalo actually bought papyrus, and he uh, he did my image. He he painted, you know, drew my image on the papyrus right there. Interesting to see. It looks like paper, but it, you can tell, you can see where it's the, 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 the strip like, and it's pressed like that. It's pressed firm like that. So uh, just it, interesting to see, and and it does make a good paper. Though. But but this letter is very brief because John hopes to talk ever, to everybody face to face with his original writers, readers. In other words, uh, this particular letter had three hundred Greek words in it. I think it was three hundred Greek words. So that means that it, it fit on one page, okay? And so that's and and the same with Third John, fit on one page. So he, he wants to talk face to face. He knows uh, that a letter is no substitute for a face to face visit. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. It's true. There's no substitute for face to face. Okay, when he teaches in person, uh, the listeners can ask questions, discuss problems, and thereby learn more. Right? Yes. That's what I love about this about house church and I am yet to I'm yet to get where where I want to be with it but I love the fact that even if I'm preaching you can you can shout out you can talk you can ask questions things like that okay I'm gonna keep going a lot of time but I'm gonna try to answer it too right but like even on Wednesday nights though we can talk and you can ask you can say things and and you know, I, I'll, at the end, I'll pause and I'll say, anybody got any comments or anything you want to add to it or any discussion you want to make with it? Because I love that. I, I think we need that. And I think the more we talk about the Word, the more we talk about the study, the more we grow, the more we learn, the more we cement things. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? It, it's important. That's what was happening in the house churches in John's day, Paul's day. Uh, that's what they were doing. That's, that's what we need to do as well. You can't do that in big churches. You can't do that in congregations like that. Okay, So when he teaches in person, the listeners can ask questions, discuss problems, and thereby learn more. John also knows true believers will want to pursue the truth and learn all they can. How does Paul express what it means to pursue the truth in 1 Timothy 6.11? Listen to this. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. All right. I must pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and this word, steadfastness and gentleness. Bye, guys. Bye. Be Thank safe. you. Okay. Steadfastness and gentleness. So there's that word. So if you notice, he says, I must pursue, okay. those two words, pursue 
and steadfastness, right? So I've got to pursue a steadfast nature in Christ. And what that does, when I have that kind of truth, then I'm going to be able to express the kind of love that God wants me to express. All right, so John knows his readers are going to be, will be complete, or John knows his readers' joy will be complete in verse 12 when he can teach and fellowship with them face to face. That's one of the reasons I kind of long to go back to Tucson and do that with them. Those, those other believers that are there, those that are our good friends, and, and, and you know, I've taught for years, um, I want to do it again because there's something about face to face that, that has a, a deeper meaning. Uh, even over the internet, even over doing this online or whatever, face-to-face -face is, is much better. All right, so anyway, uh, he goes on to say, John also uses the statement that our joy may be complete in the first epistle. In 1 John 1, 4, he says that there uh, as well. So John concludes this epistle, the children of your elect sister greet you. The elect sister probably refers to the sister church where John is staying or uh, of which he is a member. The word children then refers to the members of that particular church. So he opens with that phrase to the elect and to the children and he closes with that phrase from the elect uh, and the children. Okay, so uh, basically that's one of the reasons they say, well, it was probably to a church, from a church. Okay, like that. So this epistle here, he says, warns us of the tendency to overlook the importance of biblical truth in the name of love. Now you might want to underline that, that, that phrase right there. This epistle warns us of the tendency to overlook the importance of biblical truth in the name of what? Love. love. We have to be careful. Because we think we're acting in love when we accept these things. But that's not godly love. That's not biblical love. Remember, love is based on what? Truth. truth. God's love is based on what? God's truth. truth. Yeah. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only begotten son. And a lot of people say, well, that's what that means. God so loved the world. Yeah, he loved the world. He loved the world. But he loves his children much more intensely and differently than he loved the world. Does, does that make sense? It's born out of this love, knowing that many of them will do what? Repent and receive Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. So it's still based in truth. It's still based in biblical truth. Let me put it to you this way. Um, I love children everywhere. I love all children. Okay? But I loved my children differently than I loved everybody else's children. Okay. Right? Why? Because they were what? Mine. Mine. They belonged to me. Okay? And, and that's the way God feels about his children. Right? He loves the whole world, but he particularly loves who? His children. Why? Because we belong to him. We belong to him. So his love for us is different than the rest of the world. I, in that sense, he, he loves us. I mean, you've been reading that book about Noah. Hopefully you've been checking out that. I mean... God loved the whole world, but he put them all to death. Except for yeah. one family who were his, right? They belonged to him. The rest of the world did not, and they all perished. The judgment came like that. So, you know, th there is God who created everything, who sent, because of his love for all of humanity, sent his son to die in our place so that by receiving Christ we can have eternal life in heaven, right? Yes. So, but at the same time, you know, he's got to judge everybody, right? And we've already been judged. That's the good news, amen? We've already been judged. For those who have rejected Christ or who don't, don't really know Christ, their judgment is yet to come. That's the difference between the Bema Seat judgment, right, and the Great White Throne judgment. All right, so... He says, what are we commanded to do in Jude 3? All right, here we go. Caleb, you ready? All right, go for it. All right, good job. Thank you. All right, so I'm to contend for the faith. 
That's what he says. I'm to contend for the faith in Jude that was once for all delivered to who? Who's it delivered to? To the saints, to you and I, to those who believe in Christ. So we have to contend for that faith. We have to, we have to, we have to love on the basis of that faith. Okay? Now, 2 John stands in direct opposition to the frequent cry for ecumenism, ecumenism, ecumenism <laughs> or religious unity, all right, among everybody, right? Yeah. I mean, it stands in direct opposition to that. John teaches that love and truth are inseparable within Christianity. It's inseparable. Truth must always guide the exercise of love. And love must stand the test of truth. So the main lesson of this book is that truth determines the bounds of love. Okay? Truth determines the bounds of love. What are the bounds of love? God determines that. On the basis of his Bible. On the basis of his word. Biblical truth determines the bounds of love. Where does truth come from? The Bible. The Bible. We, you know, we, we, we say, well, truth come, all truth comes from God. How, well, how do you, what do you know? What is from God? How do we know that? Well, it's all from God. Everything is from God. Really? See, that's a problem in our culture today, isn't it? Because a lot of people are believing that. And they believe that love is accepting of anybody and everything. But the Bible says, no, that's not love. That's not love. That's not godly love. That's not biblical love. Ba basically, all you're doing is joining in with that kind of unholiness and unrighteousness and immorality. Real love exalts the truth and embraces the truth and sets the bounds for where that love stops. I cannot love somebody outside the body of Christ like I can love somebody inside the body of Christ. Does that make sense? I can love them in Christ to the point of wanting to see them saved and born again. I can love them beyond their own sin even in that sense, but I can't love them like I love my brothers and sisters in Christ who agree with me doctrinally, who agree with me in the terms of the biblical truth and the basics of the Bible. We have a fellowship with one another that I can never have with somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ as their only personal Lord and Savior. Yeah. Does that make sense? So my love does have boundaries, right? At least the kind of love that's being expressed. So that's, that's the teaching here in second john it's it's hard and and when you break it down and really get into what he's really saying you discover man there's it's pretty deep stuff because what he's teaching us is that we've got to stop sacrificing truth under the name of love and and the only way to do that is to put the boundaries there and the brakes on so we got to, uh, love must exist before love can unite because truth generates love. So for there to be unity, there has to be love, but before there can be love, there has to be what? Truth. We have to agree on the Bible, right? Okay, so when someone compromises the truth, true Christian love and unity are destroyed. And that's what happens in a house church or any church when... Uh, I mean, these are struggles that uh, my son has faced in his church and, and every pastor's faced. I remember, I remember one small group meeting in Tucson. We had a guy come in uh, who, uh, you know, his sole purpose for being there, even though he professed to be a Christian, his sole purpose for being there was to promote um, false teaching within the group. And he challenged me every step of the way in the teaching and as we were doing that. Finally, when it came right down to it, I recognized this is not a guy who's here to learn. This is not a guy who wants to learn from me. This is a guy who wants to take over. He wants to convert this group. And so I had to sit down with him, and I had to sit down at, at the beginning of one of the sessions, and I said, sorry, you can't. No, it was at the end of the one session. Uh, when I finally came to grips with the reality of what he was doing, I sat down with him. I said, look, I just got to tell you, um, 
I, I, you're not really going to be welcome here anymore. And, uh, and I said, because it's, it's plain to me that you have an agenda, and, uh, and it's not my agenda. It's not what I want for this group. And so on the basis of that, I can't let you continue to be here and teach these things and, and express these things and challenge me at every level because that doesn't work. We're here because we love one another, because we want to grow deeper in our understanding of the Word of God. We don't need what you're trying to peddle. And he said, well, obviously you really aren't much of a pastor at all. And I said, I guess not. See you later. He crossed the boundaries of my love. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. My love had to stop right there. And basically, I had to say, see ya. And uh, what I did by doing that was protect the group. And he was there by invitation from the host home. But when the host home owner heard what he was spouting, they were like, uh, no, wait, Pastor, can you get rid of them? You know? And, uh, and so without them looking bad, so I took the, you know, I, I took the heat for it, right? Does that make sense? And so, which is okay. But, but that's the whole principle that John's trying to get across here, is we, we have to be careful of that. And, uh, and, and there, there has to be those who are willing to step up and say, no, the boundary's been crossed. It's, it's time to move away. Does this make sense? Okay. All right. Uh, so that's the whole teaching. That's the study. And I think that's all we're going to do in this subject of steadfast living. Um, I'm not sure where we're going to go next in our Wednesday night studies. So I'll pick something out and we'll, we'll go on from there. Uh, I've been thinking about it, praying about it, but I'm not sold on any one yet. So uh, and God leads me, we'll, we'll know what we're going to do next and stuff like that.